Firstly, uh, I'll try and keep this tight, but like Grace, I'm quite prepared to use 10 words when I could use one. I'm confident I'm stopping you getting back with a glass of wine or a pot of tea, and maybe watching some highlights of some sport. Um, secondly, I want to say thanks to Andy, to Johnny, uh, to all the RGS team, unbelievable event, and, uh, and actually to all the tech people as well for, for organising this. I think Andy mentioned that these events are designed to empower the youth of tomorrow. I want to say that they're already empowered. I would actually argue that it's the youth of tomorrow that are empowering us. And I'm going to talk about a number of those threads today, try and do it in 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, and it's really interesting, starting with Sophia at the start of the day, 11 years old, I believe, wonderfully erudite, talking about uh, what we miss out on during COVID, human connection, the idea of being humane, the idea of play. Uh, Dahlia and Fazia are afterwards talking about new, new knowledge and old knowledge, connections, education, fear. Uh, right way through to Felicity and Grace, talking about anthropology, learning, asking questions. In fact, the themes that I've chosen, and there's only two or three of them, have been mentioned in nearly every single TED talk tonight, um, which is really interesting. Uh, I think Steve Jobs said you can only join the dots backwards, so I'm going to share what I've learned. I, I definitely wasn't the brightest student when I was here from, from 1991 to 97, and that was demonstrated by the fact that I just went to find the toilets and got lost in a school that I spent seven years at. Um, but it's changed a bit, that's my excuse. Uh, so I'm going to write a lamp on the landing page. Uh, I've mainly spent my career just smashing down the status quo, uh, removing false objections because I know it's easier than the ES, but I've also probably not spent it doing as much preparation as I should, and the, the title may not lead directly into the session. But I'll start by showing my school report from when I was six years old. Um, he talked too much, uh, he disrupted, and he always wants to play. It hasn't changed, it didn't change. For, uh, I still talk too quickly, I talk too much. Uh, but certainly the idea of disruption, the idea of play, become quite fashionable. Um, and maybe, in many ways, they're going to be a theme for my presentation today. Um, I'm going to talk about shared values and belief. Values that were forged in these kind of rooms, although this used to be a library, at the playgrounds, the playing fields. I'm going to talk about the idea of, of finding stories. Storytelling has been fashionable, certainly of late. Um, but not telling stories, finding stories, breaking down the executive function, networking, building new connections. The idea of play, and I think it's been mentioned in maybe seven, seven or eight out of the 11 or 12 sessions we've had. Um, but then the idea of also, as a terrifyingly bright young generation who are uh, inspired me tonight and taught me a huge amount, the idea of just cutting yourself some slack. All those really complex biopsychosocial bio issues you talked about, uh, from mental health to addiction to physical health to gender bias, neutrality, meritocracy, um, complex issues that many of us have been indoctrinated into with, we're trying to learn and grow. Um, I'll, I'll share a little bit about what I've been doing since I left grammar school. I read biology here with Jim Crowther, a uh, really inspiring teacher um, who challenged me, uh, you know, maybe not being the acutest intellect to use some of those innate attributes uh, to, to try and grow and to succeed. Uh, and being inspired, I went on to read human bi biology, a couple of leads met, and then uh, left leads met, I kind of questioned what I should do. Now, my dad was a car salesman, wonderful human being, huge heart, strong moral compass, uh, very good at sales. My mum's a secretary, and um, I was fascinated by biology, so maybe the natural next step was me to go and sell drugs. So I joined the pharmaceutical industry uh, to clarify a few things. Uh, I went and joined a big drug, drug company, San from Santa Lavo, and I worked across a range of commercial sectors in pharma and healthcare. Um, but I realised that it was an industry that had maybe become addicted to the status quo, hadn't changed for decades, and maybe didn't need to. There weren't direct consequences, and I was making a tremendous amount of money. Um, and it was in pharma that I was inspired by connections outside of pharma, both within my family and my network. Uh, my family worked in online performance marketing, some of the big corporations that they talked about, the Googles, the Densus, the Cooper Sisters of this world. And they talked about what they were doing to market brands. Charlie, about your session, you can be a very good marketer one day if you have the desire. Um, <laughs> what big brands could do to personalise information to improve user experience. And I question what we were doing in pharma. We weren't doing any of those things. Uh, we were just spending billions on soft skills and in-call quality for drug reps. Nothing wrong with drug reps, I was one. 
but I thought we could do more. So I started applying um, a data science, soft data science, industry standards to drug launches, and more luck than judgment, the drug launches went very well. I was approached by a big network agency to, um, a medium-sized network agency, to head up digital operations globally. And it was at this point I relied on a network close to me, which is my family, leaving a, a job for life, a final salary pension, when I was expecting my second daughter, and we're about to move house. I, I probably thought I shouldn't even tell my wife. I can't mention it to her under my breath while we were cleaning the dishes. I wasn't, right? and I was. Um, and she said, you should do it. I said, come on. She said, yeah, if you don't do it now, you'll be in pharma for the rest of your life. And I know, I know what inspires you, new connections, new experiences. Go and do it. I said, yeah, but I don't know how to do it. I've got imposter syndrome, and I may fail. And she's like, yeah, but you, you know, that's life. Go and do it. So um, I went with something different, and then that led me to building a number of industry firsts just by challenging the status quo, just by not always accepting a no because it's uh, maybe easier and quicker than a uh, yes. Um, I advise now startups. Uh, my day job is as chief exec and founder of a company called Performance IO, which specialises in online performance marketing in the pharmaceutical sector. Um, I then went on to co-found a robotics art and engineering company uh, out of the Media Lab at MIT. We are doing a lot in distributed ledgers, NFTs, uh, new technologies to democratise art. Um, and then my most important role is to give me the ability to uh, do a lot of pro bono work in the mental health space. I started my career in pharma and mental health. Um, and it's something I've been very passionate about ever since. The statistics say one in four. I personally think it's four in four. I think that's nonsense. Uh, I think most people I speak to tend to agree with that. And, and the, the passion that I followed my career to explore and challenge the status quo led me earlier this year to, to some minority state in one of my companies, which has given me the ability to, to spend more time with charities, doing more pro bono, the things that I think are really important, and speaking to the, the, the people who will demand um, meritocracy, the generation who will stop corruption in all politics, that will help refugee climate migration, all of these issues which we face uh, will be solved by people in rooms like this. I get really excited by that. So maybe if I share my story, I hope it helps. If you take two or three things, I would be over the moon. The first is around um, finding stories. Um, I want to share a quote uh, from um, someone who I met through networking, um, through the Peace Love Foundation, with the charity I, I sit on the board of, uh, a guy called Professor Jeremy Richman. Um, Jeremy studied what it is to be humane, the history of human violence, and by the cruelest twist of fate, he then lost his six-year-old daughter, Abiel, when she was murdered with 19 of her school friends at the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Uh, Jeremy's sadly no longer with us, but he talked about the idea of storytelling and building networks. And he said, we grow when we are together. We grow by telling stories, building our network, and seeking inspiration. When I tell you my story, it becomes your story. And this Felicity and Grace is from the Clinical Journal of Anthropology. It just shows that our neocortex grows as society grows. When we talk to each other, when we share experiences. Um, and I was fascinated by this. Um, oh, I went the wrong way. And, um, and it led me to exploring this concept more in Boston when I was up at the Media Lab talking to brighter people than I. So I'm going to go a little bit sciencey. And I thought about this, I thought, I wonder if it's too much. And then I heard the presentations tonight and realized that I'm way out of my depth uh, and you'll be absolutely fine with this. Uh, functional connectivity, brain science. Brain science is quite new, kind of 60 years old, so science that's very new. Um, but functional connectivity allows us to look at blood uh, rising and dropping in the brain and isolate different areas to not just look at what you're seeing red, but what's the experience of red. And it allows this unbelievable uh, insights into, into humanity and us as, as um, beings. But transit hypothetically is actually very simple. Transit comes and goes. Hypo, a drop uh, in the executive front function, the front of the brain. And I want to go a bit further on this and, and look at what it means. The executive function is the element that takes us through process. If you've ever driven down to Cornwall in the evening, it's raining, you're driving at 70 miles an hour, you're following, you hope you're driving at 70 miles an hour, uh, you're following the red lights at the front. So how's the journey? You just think I just couldn't tell you anything about it. I was just in auto. Making an omelet, I postulate and challenge driving to work as part of the rat race, going through that circadian rhythm with your eyes closed. 
Uh, and it's the unconsciously competent, those things we do when we experience when accidents happen, when we're not aware of the environment around us or paying attention to those signals. It's when we're consciously competent that we can predict and change and adapt uh, to some of those uh, indoctrinated behaviours that my generation needs to learn, listen, ask and change. And our parents' generation, even harder, I think they're doing a good job on the whole. Um, what I'm interested in is the science behind it, is that the biology of a creative idea is that you build new neuronal connections when you break down this process. And that's really exciting. So um, when we look at deviating and breaking down the executive function, we can see that creativity happens. And we, it, ultimately, we know that diversity, um, uh, uh, creativity and diversity, or diversity trumps ability every single time. So we talk about new encounters happen in this moment, new experiences, uh, uncommon experiences, inconsistent cultures, and alternate ideas of what we should be exploring. Um, and I want to talk about when this happens, because I can assure you now, I realise I've got my glasses on. <laughs> oh, just like, I'm fine. Um, when does it happen? It does not happen from my 20 years, and there's a number of parents in the room who have sat in the boardrooms and meetings. It doesn't happen at the flip chart. What are the three things you're going to take home and change? And those flip charts go into a drawer that no one ever looks at again. Go back to work the next day and we're really busy and we don't do anything. Less rhetoric to those point, more action. It happens when you're daydreaming. It happens when you're thinking in the shower. It happens when you're out running. It happens when you are walking through the forest and you are the needle in the group making the music. It happens when you meditate. It actually happens when you take up on LSD as well. I am not encouraging that, there's just a lot of science behind it. Um, so breaking down the executive function, uh, building new neural connections, we need to create moments for this to happen. Um, and what's interesting, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, uh, not only is how this is mimicked in the brain in society, or from society the mimetic to the brain, but where else we see it? It's children. The idea of play. Children are wonderfully hypofrontal. They ask questions, they're inquisitive, they want to learn, they want to grow. Um, and therefore, do we get old because we stop playing, or do we stop playing because we get old? And the idea of play, and being hypofrontal, and being inquisitive, and creating opportunities, breaking down the executive function, the water cooler moment, going away from your tribe, meeting new people, Getting new experiences to Ved's point, to Charlie's point, to Dahlia, to all of Dahlia, to all the team today, be prepared to listen, to learn, build new connections, take them back to your tribe and say, I met someone today, they were doing something really interesting, we should consider it. That is how my career uh, has grown, when I map it backwards. And play is right at the heart of that, and this isn't just messing around. Uh, people have talked about it all night being important. Um, there are lots of definitions of play. I didn't do what Grace did and just take them all and make up my own. I, I stole someone's. Picasso said, good artists pay, great artists do. So um, I just stole them of a company who I admire tremendously, Lego. And they say, play is defined as something you do voluntarily with no predefined outcomes that takes you outside of your comfort zone. Um, I would encourage you to seek a career that allows you to do that. I am reassured in listening to all of you that you're going to forge and craft careers that do that. But this is a core company value for people in my art company, my performance marketing company, and I see it in the, the charitable work that we do. Uh, but I don't want people to come to work with predefined outcomes. You shouldn't have to you learn, grow, be open to new ideas. I, I, don't, I don't want them to be in their comfort zone. Nothing grows in the comfort zone. And I do want them to do it voluntarily. Um, I know this is on video, it's out there forever in the ether, but I don't believe in work life balance. That doesn't mean I want my teams to do 20. Know, 18, 16 hour days, I just think it's all life. And you should explore and find something that allows you to build those new connections to play, uh, to step outside your comfort zone. Um, so two words that when learning about them here, it was around acetyl choline and um, the transmission of electrical impulses through the synaptic cleft. Um, but actually in life, and breaking it down, moving beyond rhetoric to action and, and exploring potential has come from these two uh, elements that I have reflected on and done my whole life. And I, I'm going to map back how I got the opportunity to stand in front of the brightest talent of the future of today. People will shape our societies and, and share my story. Uh, this is up in Boston at the Media Lab at MIT. The guy on my right in the photo to my left in life is a guy called Tal Achatuf, a great friend, huge inspiration to me. He's the C Samson, CTO of Samsung Ventures. 
Um, I met him because I wanted to do something in pharma that pharma said I should not do. I wanted to run an event, a hackathon, uh, which didn't invite anyone from pharma. We haven't changed things in decades. So I went to Harvard, MIT, Boeing, 23 me, lots of different companies said, come and listen to what patients are going through, what their experience of life is, and then let's think about solutions. And in 12 months, we had two solutions, one actually John Hopkins University. Now, when I launched a drug in 2009, that compound was discovered in 1994. That's the speed of innovation in pharma. 12 months, we had something in play. Um, and at that meeting, I met Tal, who said to me, we've got some really bright people at MIT, but maybe commercialization isn't their strong point. Would you come and speak to them? So I'd love to come to MIT. Again, huge imposter syndrome, but you don't say no to that. So I went to Boston several times and shared my passion for mental health and what I wanted to do in that space to give back. And I approached lots of charities, some that I've seen in the walls here. And Energy Doesn't Lie, great charities, but it, was, it just didn't feel right the right fit. And Tom invited me up and I met the guy right centre and the guy on the right, um, Matt and Jeff, who run a charity called the Peace Love Foundation. They help kids adolescents in schools, in prisons who have been affected by abuse or mental health and they help them communicate through arts and creativity. An amazing charity, but without me, commercial smarts, and they wanted to scale it. They told me what they did, and after 10 seconds I said, I'm all in. My company will do pro bono, and since then, everyone in my organisation has to do four hours a month for the Peace Love Foundation in order to get their bonus. Uh, but what that's given me has enriched my life so much uh, just watching how they smash down the status quo to help people build new connections. I met the, I was going to say the guy in Dodgy Knit, there's two of them. The guy in Green Dodgy Knit, they forgive me for that, Ben Tripp. And we co founded Art Matter out of MIT where he was teaching. Um, that led me to playing with giant robots, uh, which I never envisaged. I'm not an engineer, I'm not an artist. I think we were artists, but um, this robot will move down that track in about 30 seconds doing multiple commands, but it's not a collaborative robot, so if you get in its way, it will kill you. Um, but there's some fun robots. And then that led me, through Peace Love, to introducing them to like, J&J, and this is Paul Stoffels, the VP of J&J, so that Davos last year, just as the coronavirus was uh, starting to accelerate in terms of media coverage. And it's Paul Stoffels, as chief scientist, China scientific officer, uh, and J&J &J and great companies like that who are in front of our, um, our, our campaign to, to get back to some sort of normality and, um, and life. But actually, reflecting on all of this and wrapping up today, they breaking down the executive function, stepping outside the status quo, uh, building new connections, new neuronal connections, building connections in life, the idea of play, uh, they are things that have been forged retrospectively when I look back through my career. Uh, but actually, the values that were forged here uh, are some of the guiding principles that have, have shaped my life. Um, shared values, my support network, twice. Uh, on the rugby pitch, this was an opportunity I got to go and play in East London in South Africa. I got to tour with 38 of my best friends. I'm somewhere in the back there, very small. I'm uh, in the last way of this game. And we got absolutely hammered by some rather big South Africans as well. Um, but these opportunities to spend time with your friends, to understand different experiences, alternate ideas, have helped shape my career. And they are the people, that is the network that you fall back on through the things that you go through in life. Children, love, loss, marriage, suicide, mental health, um, meritocracy, uh, gender equality, climate change. Uh, and we still, we still put money into a bank account every month so that every couple of years we can go away and spend time together to build new connections, to get new ideas, to be inspired. Um, I want to thank you for your time tonight, challenge you all to, to be maverick, smash down the status quo. Uh, and I've spent 20 years in health and health tech, it's my passion. I have specialised in a niche, but it's been building new connections and breaking down the executive function that have allowed me to grow and allow me the opportunity to share my story with you tonight so that it becomes your story. Uh, so I want to thank you for that. I wish you a good night.